praise the Lord. I said, praise the Lord. It's a joy to be with you again, and I pray that the joy of the day will be yours in Jesus' name. I'm going to take my text from maybe a place you don't expect because you studied numbers today, and I thought two chapters are long enough for the Old Testament. I think I want to breathe the fresh air and the sunshine of the New Testament. Is that all right? Let's close our eyes for prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, who bless your name, thank you for bringing us together for this wonderful day, a day of worship and a day of wonders too. And we pray, Lord, you touch your people and you lead us into the depths of the understanding of your word today in Jesus' name. We pray that the men, the women, brothers and sisters, the old and the young, and the children and the youths, you bless every one of us in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name, we pray. You give me a good amen before you sit down. Amen. amen. Thank you. We're looking at Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2. And I'm going to read there from verses 41 to 42. Acts, chapter 2. In verse 41, it says, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day they were added unto them about, tell me out loud, 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and in breaking of bread and in prayers. If you read all the other verses there, you're going to find out quite a lot of things about the early church. And this interests me because as I look at the early church, I see the strength of the early church. You're wondering, how can the church be strong today? How can the church be what it ought to be today, especially we're getting near the coming of the Lord? And the rapture can happen anytime. And you want to be a kind of church that is stable, a church that is standing, a church that is spiritual, a church that is really expecting the coming of the Lord and is making preparation for that coming. As you look at verse 42, it says, And they continued steadfastly. And it says, In the apostles' doctrine, and in fellowship. Take those two words, doctrine and fellowship. There are churches that are without doctrine, without fellowship. And you'll, ne you'll never find strength in such a church. You go to a church because we have churches all over the land, all over the world, there are churches. But without doctrine, without fellowship. The strength of the early church is that, number one, there was doctrine. Number two, tell me, there was fellowship. And it says, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. Number two, there are those churches with doctrine without fellowship. You couldn't find fellowship, love, acceptance, unity in that church, but doctrine. And some churches are guilty of that, that we have doctrine, but there is no fellowship. On the other hand, there are churches with fellowship without doctrine. And it's all love, love, fellowship, interaction. Give me this, I give you that. Only fellowship without doctrine. But you see, the secret of the strength of the early church is that there was, number one, doctrine. Number two, there was fellowship. And it says over here, they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. Not fellowship and doctrine. There's a difference between doctrine and fellowship and fellowship and doctrine. There are some people that have fellowship before doctrine. They say, I just don't want to know what you believe. Just give me your hand, right hand, the fellowship. All I want is fellowship. We'll be talking about doctrine later because doctrine divides. And so they have fellowship before doctrine. But here it says, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. Other people say, give me a choice and be people friendly. Give me a choice of doctrine or fellowship. And so they read their own Bible as they continued in doctrine or fellowship. Make your choice. You choose doctrine, you are welcome. You choose fellowship, you are welcome. 
Whichever one you choose, whichever one you reject, it's all right with us. But the New Testament says no. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. And I've been looking at the whole of the New Testament and finding out why did they do that? How, how do we keep that today? Why do we have to keep that today, number one? Because it's the evidence of the salvation of the multitude. You see, a multitude gathered together. You had 12 apostles, you have 120 people that waited in the upper room, and then you have 3,000 people. Well, 3,000 people, that's a crowd. And what is the evidence that that multitude was actually saved? Because they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship is the salvation of the multitude made clear. Number two is a sign of membership. The sign of membership. You go to the early church and they're going to find out where do you stand? Are you born again? Are you a real child of God? Because it is that new birth that brings you into the kingdom. And the continuity that you continue, the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, actually means that you show the sign of membership. Number three is a step towards maturity. Step towards maturity. How do people get matured when there's no teaching? When there's no fellowship? When you couldn't uh, kind of place them, identify them where they belong. But because they, they continue steadfastly, the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, it shows that they were moving towards maturity. Number four is a submission to the master. They knew that the Messiah, Christ, had given us the word. And then he told his own disciples, he said, go teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Then he says, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And he says, till the end of the world, till the end of the age. And when these believers came to the Lord and they submitted themselves to the teaching of those apostles, continuing steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, it was the submission, their own submission to the master. Number five is the strength of ministry. The strength of ministry. And if you want to know whether a ministry is strong or not, you want to find out how are they on doctrine, the doctrines of the Bible? How are they in fellowship? That they're able to get the people together. You have those 3,000 people that came to know the Lord. It's not that 150 or 500 people out of 3,000 are backsliding. And we come to church the following Sunday and we have only maybe about 1,000. And you know, churches today will do a lot of evangelism. So many people are coming to the Lord. But the point is, where is the continuity? They continued in the Apostles' Doctrine and Fellowship to show the strength of their ministry. Number six is the stability of mentoring. The stability of mentoring. You see, all those 120 people, they are touch with all the new converts. They were mentoring them. They were developing them, discipling them. Because actually Jesus didn't say just go make converts. A lot of babies in the church and there's no maturity. He wanted them to be mentored so that their lives will be growing in the understanding of the word of God. So number six, it shows the stability of their mentoring. Number seven is the success of the ministers. Show me a minister that's able to bring all those converts in and then is able to make all the disciples and all those members of the church continue in doctrine and fellowship. And I say that minister is successful. The success of the ministers. Number eight is the survival of each member. The survival of each member. How do members survive? That is, they've come to know the Lord and they say they're children of God, they are part of the church. I will show that they are surviving spiritually because they continue in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. It is that continuity that they stay. That's how we understand that they are actually surviving. Number nine is a strategy for multiplication. Strategy for multiplication. You're going to find out in the Acts of the Apostles that. You know, those people were able to go out and plant churches. They were able to go out and raise churches. And they brought in many other people. Why? Because they knew the doctrine. 
Didn't you the fellowship? And because of being exposed to the doctrines of Christ and doctrines of the apostles, that's the reason why they were able to go here, plant a church, go there, plant a church, go there, plant a church. It wasn't just a one-man show that you have a great apostle there, a great Peter there, or a great Stephen there, only those few people. They multiplied the workers. They multiplied the ministers. Because all of them had continued in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. And as you read the chapter 2, you are going to find out the miracles that happened later. Signs and wonders. And you're asking yourself, How is it, it was so easy. You know, sometimes when you read that, uh, you know, the Peter just was going on the way. And then a shadow came upon those people that were sick and they got healed. It was just simple like that. Acts chapter 3, silver and gold have I known. What I have I give unto you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth rise up and walk and the fellow just rose up after Peter held him up and then were rejoicing. How did that happen? And then Philip went to Samaria and then he preached the word unto them. There was great joy in the city because demons came out of many, many people were healed. How was it so simple like that? Because they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. Number 10 is a secret or the source of miracles. The secret or the source of miracles. And so that's the reason it's very important for us to look at this again and find out the early church, the strength of the early church. That's what I'm talking about today, the strength of the early church. As I look at this chapter, two or three things come out very clear. Number one, the salvation and the steadfastness in the early church. The salvation and the steadfastness in the early church. Number two, the sanctification and spirituality in the edified, edifying church. The sanctification and the spirituality in the edified church and edifying church. That you'll find is the two sides of the coin in the early church. All the members came in and they were edified. They were developed, they were matured, they were built up, and they were growing. They were edified on the other hand, and then on the other hand, they were edifying each other. What a church that was. Edified church, edifying church, the sanctification and the spirituality. Number three, the state and the standing of the end time church. We fall into that category. We have spoken about the early church. We have spoken about the edified church who became the established church. And then the end time church. The church of today. As we look at the church of today, where are we? What's the state of the end time church? What's the standing of the end time church? And you want to be able to locate your own local church or identify your own local church and say, which one do we look like? Do we look like the early church, the edified church, the edifying church, or do we look like, you know, the church in prophecy, which is the end time prophecy? Let's come to number one. Number one is the salvation and the steadfastness of in the early church. I'm looking at Acts of the Apostles chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, we're reading from verse 37. It says, now, when they heard... The word when they heard this, they were they were preached in their hearts, and they said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Men and brethren, what shall we do? The early church was an evangelical church, evangelical church. They heard the word. And conviction came to them as a result of what they heard. And then they said, what shall we do? Have you noticed that in most of our churches, and I mean generally, most of the, the churches generally, we hear the word of God, and after that we say grace, the, you know, mercy and truth or whatever will follow me after the, all the days of my life. And that's all. We don't think we're going to do anything about the message. Or we just say in the name of the Father and the Son, the Holy Ghost, say amen, and then we disperse. We are gone. Because we do not know there is something to do about the message of the word of God. But you know, it says, what shall we do? They knew that when they heard the word of God, conviction came on them. And from that conviction, we must do something before conversion will come. And they were told in verse 38, and Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized 
every one of you. Repent and be baptized. There's something to do when we hear the word of God. I'm sure you've heard, uh, you know, some of the evangelical people telling us there's nothing to do. That Christ has done it all. He did it on the cross of Calvary. So, now there is nothing for anybody to do. I said, okay, if that is true, there's nothing for anybody to do. Why isn't the world saved? There's something to do. That's why the people said, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter didn't say, ah, uh-uh, don't do anything. Christ died for everyone already. There's nothing to do. But he said, this is what you do. Repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Then you are baptized. And it is that that brings the real change. Look at verse 40 there. In verse 40 it says, that's Acts chapter 2, verse 40. It says, and with many other words, did he testify and exhort, saying, save yourself from this untoward generation. It means separate yourself from this wicked generation. That's what they were to do. And then it says in verse 41, then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Thank God they were saved. I said, thank God they were saved. And when people come to our church, we, we love you to invite people, but that is not salvation. We love people to, you know, come to our church, but that, just coming, is not salvation. We hear the word of repentance. Then we think about ourselves, about our lives. We, uh, allow me to use this word, internalize that message that you crucified Christ. Your sin crucified Christ. You are guilty before God. You are guilty before heaven. And you put that message inside, and then you come under conviction. And you say, oh Lord, I'm guilty. I'm a sinner. What will I do? I know eternity is before me. I know Christ died for me so that I can be saved. But what do I do? And then the message comes back again. Repent. Because except ye repent, ye shall likewise perish. And he told us to preach this repentance starting in Jerusalem and then in all nations until the end will come. That repentance is very important. And as then we yield ourselves to the Lord and then we get rid of our sins and turn turn from sin and turn to the Savior. Then that salvation comes and then we now continued in the, apostles, in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. Look at verse 47. In verse 47 it says, praising God and having favor with all the people and the Lord added to the church such as should be, tell me the word, saved, salvation. That was the emphasis in the early church. The emphasis in the early church is not just come to church. The emphasis in the early church is, you know, just come and fellowship with us. They brought them to the point of salvation. And when people come to the church, maybe they are even saved before they come. They've been an honor, but there's, there's, no, there's no harm in saying, my brother, are you saved? My sister, are you saved? I see that you know the Bible. I see that, you know, you've come to fellowship with us. Uh, are you born again? Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You don't want to be guilty of having somebody in the church for one month or three months or six months or one year and the fellow was never confronted the word, with the word of being born again of salvation. And so you have them here. They were saved. And then... The beauty of it is that they continue, which I told you, that was the evidence of the salvation of the multitude. I pray you'll continue in Jesus' name. And let, let's pick up that word continue from, this, from the statement of Jesus in John chapter 8. John chapter 8, I'm reading from verse 13. And as he spake these words, many believed on him. That's the point of initial salvation, that they accepted the word they embraced the word, they believed the word, they were saved. They turned away from their sin. Repentance had happened. Believing on the Lord Jesus Christ as the only Savior had happened to them. Now, Jesus said in verse 31, it said, And then said Jesus unto those Jews which believed on him, If ye, what's the word? If ye, tell me the word. If you, tell me the word. Continue in my word, then 
Are you my disciples indeed? That means it's very important to continue. It's not, it's not enough to say, I believe, I believe. And then, do you attend any church? No, I just believe. I don't have to go to any church. After all, Jesus has done everything. What Jesus did on Calvary, whether I continue or not, is enough for me and I'm going to heaven. No, Jesus said, that's not enough. That's just the initial step you take and then you are now on your way to heaven. If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. John chapter 15. In John chapter 15, I'm reading there from verse 9. John chapter 15, verse 9. These are the words of Jesus Christ. And it's so important for us to follow the Lord and follow the Savior. In verse 9, it says, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Tell me the rest. Continue ye in my love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. That whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Yes, he loved the world. And yes, he loves you. But continue, continue in my love. He has manifested that love on the cross of Calvary. And he says for you to actually be part of the body of Christ. And for you to be part of the church, righteous church, reputable church that is going to heaven. You must continue in my love. I pray you'll continue in Jesus' name. Uh, the question is, do all people actually continue? I don't think so. As you look at the Bible, it's not everybody doesn't continue. And so that's why it's important for you to make up your mind and you make a choice and say, here, here am I. I've come to know the Lord Jesus Christ and there's one thing that must stay with me. I must continue. At least you know that Jesus Christ fed multitudes, he ministered to multitudes, he healed multitudes. And then Paul the Apostle tells us that when he rose up from the dead, only about 500 people showed up to even see him. He said, I'm dying, I'm going to die, and I will be buried for three days, and then on the third day I will rise again. Meet me in Galilee. He told all those people, only 500 out of those thousands of people. One time he fed 5,000, other time another 4,000, another time another multitude. Of all those multitudes, think about that. Of those 500, he said, you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea, Samaria, then to the uttermost part of the earth, more than 500, he told them, how many people were in the upper room? 120. What happened to the 380? They did not continue. Continuing is a personal choice. I'm saved, I'm born again, and he put me in the body of Christ, and I want to continue, and I will to continue. I make up my mind, I want to continue. I pray you'll continue. Look at John chapter 6. John chapter 6. I read there from verse 60. Many therefore of his disciples, not of the sinners, many therefore of his disciples, not of the Pharisees, many therefore of his disciples, not of the Sadducees, many therefore of his disciples, when they heard this said, this is a hard saying. Who can hear it? There were disciples. There were people that said, I believe this is the Christ. I believe this is the Messiah. I believe this is the one that was sent to take us away from our sins and then to take us to the Father and take us to heaven. But it says, when he preached a particular message unto them, you see, the test of our salvation and the test of discipleship is that you are not picking and choosing from the word of God. I like that message. I don't like that one. Which one do you like? It's like saying, God has given you your body. I like my hand. I don't like my ears. Cut them off then. I like my mouth. I don't like my nose. The body of truth. Everything he has given us. And so we don't have the liberty and the luxury of making a choice. I like this. I don't like this. This one is sweet, but this one is bitter. And that's what they were doing here. They were making choices. They were making selection. They were sifting the word of God. Look at verse 66. It says in verse 66, from that time, many of his who? 
disciples, many of his disciples went back and they walked no more with him. They said, if it's like that, I can't hear that. Repentance, I didn't come for that. Righteousness, I didn't come for that. Holiness, without which no man shall save the Lord, I didn't come for that. And then that you do unto others as you want them to do unto you, I didn't come for that. All I came for is, I came for miracle. No, it's more than a miracle. If you're going to get to heaven, we're here because this is the gateway to heaven. We're going to heaven. I said we're going to heaven. You know, when healing will not matter, when casting out devils will not make any meaning, and when prosperity money will not have any value, when the only thing that will mean anything to anybody is holiness, that's the time you want to be ready and say, praise the Lord, have something more than prosperity, have something more than healing, have something more than, you know, all the signs and wonders. I have this salvation and this holiness that takes us to heaven. But because these people are not centering their attention on that they could no more walk with him and you think that Jesus will say ah, I'm sorry about that what did I preach that all those people went away all those multitudes of people the people who are so eager and they were running after me master when did you come here and then they have all gone and they just will tell the rest and say you know why are you, you are taking everything I just said that I didn't mean that what I meant is that's what some preachers do if they see that they preach something and then they say, Pastor, you know what? Uh, so and so that was here last week, that thing is, is of the bombshell. You threw on the people and now they are not here. What are they going to do? Then the pastor will come. I don't think a pastor here will do that. I said, I don't think a pastor here will do that. But you know, some pastors, they come and say, now, uh, before the message today, I just want to you know, tell you, I, I learned that some of you were affected and uh, offended by what I said last week. You know, you count everything serious. I just said that. Now, cheer up and, you know, welcome every and say, you are welcome. Don't go away. This is your church and this is home. Don't you go anywhere. We love you here. Whichever one you can take, take. Whichever one you cannot take, don't worry about that. Uh, we'll carry you along anyway. We're all going to, how many of us are going to heaven? Amen. We're going to heaven. Jesus didn't say that. And we don't have any right to say that either. We're not looking for a crowd here that will not get to heaven. We're looking for people who are serious-minded and they want to get to heaven on the final day. I believe that's why you are here. Don't you know the name of the church? What do they call this church? They say it's deeper. Day. It's not shallow Christian life ministry. This one is deeper life Bible church. And it's a Bible church. Did you come with your Bible today? How could you come to deeper life? Bible church without a Bible. Thank God I always go with my Bible. I said I always go with my Bible. Look at verse 67 here. Then said Jesus unto the twelve. Will ye also go away? Will ye also go away? He said, I'm ready to start all over again. If you all go away, will ye also go away? You see, that's the strength of the ministry. That you know what you are preaching and you are very sure about what you are preaching. And then when you preach the word and then people react negatively to that, then you don't backpedal and say, I'm sorry about what I said. Will ye also go away? Then verse 68 says, Then Peter, Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast, tell me. So what, I would look, what you are looking for is eternal life, not healing. Not prosperity. Not, uh, you know, freedom, deliverance. We're looking for eternal life. And we know you have the words of eternal life. That's why they were not going. That's why they continued. I pray you'll continue. Acts of the Apostles chapter 14. Acts chapter 14. I'm reading there from verse 22. Acts 14 verse 22. Acts 14 verse 22. Confirming the souls of the disciples. And exhorting them to continue in the faith. That's the secret. That's how we're going to take people to heaven. To continue in the faith. And then it says, and they returned to continue in the faith. And that through much tribulation, trial, temptation, persecution. Through much tribulation, we enter into the kingdom of God. God. And so we learn that we must continue in the teaching of the word of God as well as in fellowship. Um, we are looking at um, 
Acts chapter 2 again. Acts chapter 2. And I want to talk about the sanctification and the spirituality in the edified, edifying church. The sanctification and spirituality in the edified, edifying church. We're looking at Acts chapter 2, verse 42. In Acts chapter 2, verse 42, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and in breaking bread and in prayers. As you look at this Acts chapter 2, something strikes you, which is very significant. When Jesus Christ was with his disciples, a lot of times there's argument who is greater among us, greater than the other fellow. Who is the greatest here? They were always measuring. You see, they, were, uh, they had a particular disease. It was a disease of you know, self-recognition, self-importance, self-propagation. And I want to, well, what's my position here? What's my, you know, what's my number here? Am I number one or number two or number three? I want to know. That was in their mind all the time. And even when Jesus told them and he was saying that now I'm going to Calvary, I'm going to die, on the third day I will rise again, all that was not important to them. The important thing is who is the greatest among us? And Jesus saw that disunity and he began to pray for them, for their sanctification, sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. And then he said, the reason I'm praying for that sanctification is that they all may be one. They all may be as thou father art in me and I in you, that they may be made one in us. Perfect in one. And you see that oneness came to this church. Look at this now. Acts chapter 2 verse 1. Acts chapter 2. I'm reading there from verse 1. You see, it says, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. The unity had come. And there was no argument now. Who is number one? Who is number two? Who is number three? What recognition are the people giving to me? You know, people are too conscious of that. What name or title do I bear? You call somebody, brother, so and so. Then he doesn't answer. He's looking at you. Say, bro, what's the matter? Me, you are calling bro so and so. I am apostle so and so. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know that's what you are waiting for. Apostle, title without power. Title without any signs and wonders. Good morning, apostle. Aha, uh -huh, you know me now. You recognize me now. That was not in the early church. It wasn't in the early church at all. You know, as you look at the early church, that unity came because of that sanctification. Big I, little you, was not there. That's why I read it to you now. Acts chapter 2, verse 1. They continue one accord in one place. And let's look at that same chapter 2 as these 3,000 came together. And now, after they came to know the Lord, I'm reading now from verse 43. And it says, Fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were what? Together and at all things common. And he sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. Verse 46. And they, what's the next word? Continuing daily. How? What's one accord in the temple? One accord. No arguments again when we're sanctified. You know, that's not like, you know, they're not considering me here because, you know, this is what I want. It's no more what you want. It's what Christ has ordained. And he says, this is the way. Walk ye therein. And that's why there was no argument among them anymore. Saved and sanctified. And that's what we still believe, that when we're sanctified, you know, all the arguments, all the disagreements, all the discord, all the, you know, self-importance and self-pity or self-proclamation or whatever, all that is gone. And it says over here, they were all with one accord and in the temple and says and breaking bread from house to house and did eat their meat 
with gladness and what? Singleness of heart. Their hearts were knit together, joined together. The sanctification and the spirituality in the edified church, edifying church. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, you find out uh, when it says they contain the apostles' doctrine, this actually on what they built the church, on what they built their lives. Ephesians chapter 2, we're reading from verse 20. Ephesians chapter 2, reading from verse 20. Here it tells us, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. They were built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Christ had given the doctrines to the apostles. And the apostles faithfully, they just continued that same doctrine. And it started with repentance. Then there's restitution. And then there's righteousness. Then there's that second experience that is definite of sanctification and holiness. And their lives turned around. And then all the other things he gave them. And so they learned the doctrines and they believed the doctrines and they lived by the doctrines. And if you ask any of them because they continue steadfastly, they could tell you this is what we believe and they stood for it. And if they met other people outside that didn't stand for that, there was no confusion. They just knew that that other fellow has not been taught, but praise the Lord, had been taught. When I went to school, if I, you know, you went to secondary school, then you met, you know, a playmate who didn't happen not to go to secondary school and just said, in primary two, primary three. And then you were saying something. You just say, it's possible to do that. And then he says, that's what possible. What does that mean? Because you've gone to secondary school. It's not going to say, you primary two, primary three. Possible, possible. What does that mean? And then he says, okay, I don't even accept that word. Well, because he doesn't accept, that shows his ignorance. Nothing wrong with me. I know the word. I use the word. And then you bring out another word. You say, so what's that? What's that? That's, I, don't, I don't think that's right. And you know it is right. You are not going to be confused because you know his ignorance is playing out. Therefore, his ignorance will not change your knowledge. The same thing with the word of God. If you have learned the word of God because you continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, then you are believing something, standing for something. Then you meet somebody. He also goes to church, primary school church. And then you say, here is the word. And he says, I don't know that. I don't accept that. Who is to be ashamed? The one that knows the truth or the one that doesn't know the truth? You know, in the days in which we live, the people that know the truth, they feel ashamed. Or they say, they apologize for the truth they know. You never apologize for being in the truth. You are confident. You say, ah, if you didn't know that, I'll teach you. Then you give them the word of God. We never back out or back down because of the ignorance of other people. When you continue in the apostles' doctrine, you have nothing to apologize for. I said, you have nothing to apologize for. If anybody needs to apologize at all, it's the other people who are not studying the word that have to apologize. I will not apologize for the truth. Because ye shall know the truth. And the truth shall make you free. You'll be free in Jesus' name. Yeah, it says they continue the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. And let's look at uh, Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. I'm reading there from verse... 11. Ephesians chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 11. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. He says, for the perfecting of the saints. You know what? You'll never be perfected for heaven without continuing in the apostles' doctrine. He gave us apostles. He gave us prophets. He gave us evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the perfecting of the saints. If you're looking for, you know, just something sweet, 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 every Sunday when you come, just fellowship every time you come, and motivation 
every, every Sunday you come. Motivation is not going to mature you. Motivation is not going to kind of disciple you and perfect you. But he gives some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints. And it says for the work of the ministry. If our workers are going to be strong, we need that work to continue in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship. And then it says also for the edifying of the body of Christ. Look at verse 13. Then it, uh, it says in verse 13, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto what kind of man? A perfect man. Unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And that's our sanctification and spirituality right there. Now, let me come back to this word again. The word is continue. They continued, and we're going to continue. I said we're going to continue. Romans chapter 11. In Romans chapter 11, we're looking at verse 22. Romans 11. I'm reading from verse 22. 11.22, it says, Behold, therefore, the goodness and the severity of God on them which fell severity, but toward thee, goodness, if thou continue. You see the condition there? It says, the goodness of God will be upon you, and the grace of God will continue with you, if ye continue. In his goodness, he says, otherwise thou also shall be cut off. When somebody has, uh, proclaims to be born again, I'm saved. I'm a child of God. But he does not continue. He says, otherwise, if you don't continue, you'll be cut off. There's nothing like, you know, I'm saved, I'm saved, and that's all. I can be careless. I can backslide. I can go back into sin. I can go into public sin and private sin. What does it matter? I'm saved. No, it matters a lot because if you do not continue in the grace of God, in the goodness of God, it says you'll be cut off. I pray you'll not be cut off in Jesus' name. Uh, look at Colossians chapter 1. In Colossians chapter 1, continue. That's the word, continue, continue. Colossians chapter 1, I read from verse 23. Colossians 1, we're looking at verse 23. Colossians 1. Verse 23. In verse 23, it says, If ye continue. Do you see that little word, if? That means there is a condition. You are born again. Praise the Lord. You are saved. Praise the Lord. You have repented. Praise the Lord. But now it says, If ye continue. And there, there are some people that just say, they go by feeling, they do not go by the evidence of a changed life, the evidence of a transformed life. I feel I'm still a child of God. Anybody can feel anything. I feel good. I feel all right. A person can feel all right. Have you heard of people that have a, a hypertension? And then the, the doctor says, any headache, no headache. Any palpitation of your heart, no palpitation at all. Do you find any, have you, do you feel weak on your feet? There's nothing at all. I feel strong. And the fellow is about dying. And they measure the blood pressure. And they say, how did he even get to the hospital here? This is terrible. Is this was terrible? I eat normally. I sleep normal. Everything is normal. I feel good. Your health doesn't depend on I feel good. You have to go through the test. When you do the medical test, and then the doctor says, this is terrible. You're about dying. There's some Christians like that, you know. They just say, I feel good. I feel all right. Because you see, an ignorant conscience will make you feel good. You can do whatever because your conscience is ignorant. That's how you are feeling good. Go back to the word. And when you read the word, it says, if ye continue, that continuity in the faith is very important. We're going to continue in Jesus' name. So don't tell me you're feeling good. You're feeling all right. I feel I'm okay. No, it's not your feeling. What does the Bible say? What does the word say? Look at that again, Colossians chapter 1, verse 23. If ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel. It says, which ye have heard. And it says, and which was preached to everyone, to every creature, which is under heaven, whereby I, Paul, am made a minister. It is to continue, I will continue. 
I said I will continue. Now, uh, there are two words uh, we've been thinking about or reading about in Acts chapter 2 and verse 40. Chapter uh, 2 verse 42 it says, they continue steadfastly in the apostles, number one. Number two, fellowship. Fellowship. That fellowship is very important. Fellowship. I'm asking myself, what is fellowship? Because there are many people who just say, I'm in the fellowship. I say, are you? I attend fellowship. I say, do you? I have fellowship. They say, you know, fellowship. And I'm asking myself, what is fellowship? They don't have any interaction with anybody. They're in fellowship. They don't love anybody or sense the love of anyone. And they say fellowship. And I'm saying, what is fellowship? Fellowship, F, means forgiveness. You have experienced the forgiveness of Christ. And then you are passing on that forgiveness to other people. And there is no barrier between you and your brother. No barrier between you and your sister. You are forgiven. And you are forgiving other people. E is for a define. You know, you edify me, I edify you. You are not my enemy, I'm not your enemy. We edify each other. It is when I see that edification passing from one to the other, then I know there is fellowship. L is for love. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. It is when that love is there, I know there is fellowship. It's not just that I came to fellowship, I went to fellowship today. I experienced fellowship today. And I say, was there love there? I wasn't thinking about that. All I just know is that I went for fellowship. And then there is light. If we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with the other. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. There is light in the fellowship, the light of the gospel, the light of the word of God. I think in fellowship, there is the O of openness. Have you, have you found people who are, you know, they're very secretive? They're very secretive. You know, if they are writing something, they, cover, they do it like this. They cover it. I say, my brother, we're in fellowship. What's that? He says, no, you mustn't see this other one. And then if, you know, you, their phone rings and then you pick up the phone, you want to, you say, drop it, drop it. You say, why? I don't want you to see the names there. I thought you were in fellowship. I thought there's openness in fellowship. And then they, they get something, and then you are trying to say, well, who is that? Who, what is that? They say, no, this is not for, this is not for public consumption. Uh-huh, I'm public. Okay. Not for public consumption. Go your way then. But when I thought openness is part of fellowship. They're even husbands and wives. They're in fellowship together only at night, but during the day, no openness. Where's the fellowship? You see, when we talk of fellowship, we're talking of forgiveness, to so forgive each other. We're talking of edifying each other. We're talking of loving each other. We're talking of walking in the light. We're talking of openness. And then we're talking about a W there is winsomeness, winsomeness. You know, you have, you have a good attitude. You're not a repelling fellow. You're not like, you know, this uh, thing they use, the fleet. Uh, they used to drive away mosquitoes. And nobody is trying to drive you away like mosquito. If you are real fellowship, there is there's no repellent or there's nothing that is you know scaring you away because there is no fear in love. You know, if I fear you, we don't have fellowship. If you fear me, we don't have fellowship. If I feel that if I say that I'm going to be in trouble then there's no fellowship. If the pastor here comes and he knows that this is the word of God to preach, but then he says, if I preach that, although that is the truth, if I say that, I'll get into trouble with the church. There's no fellowship. Fellowship is winsomeness and openness. I pray that a real fellowship in this church in Jesus' name. And then S is for sharing. Have you seen in Acts of the Apostles chapter 2? None of them said any of the things they had was their own. Because they just shared. They just shared. And if there is fellowship, there is going to be sharing. H, there is honesty. Honesty. They said, look for seven men of honest report. Honest report. That, you know, we can testify about you. That's what brings us into fellowship. But when there's dishonesty and there is craftiness, when there's, we're too wise, too wise to be grabbed, to say, you know, the man is coming this way and say, where are you coming from? I'm coming from the southeastern part of 
mercy or whatever, and then of, they describe it in such a way that you say, tell me outright. Where are you coming from? I told you from the southwest of, I have to go and take a chart and then be looking at southwest. You see, there's something you're hiding. But when things are open, when there is fellowship, all that will not be there. And I'm saying, let us come into real fellowship. I said, we'll come into real fellowship. And I can tell, you know, uh, you ask me, I have a brother, I say, brother, so locate him is in that place. Because I'm in fellowship with him. I can tell where to, to find him. Where is sister so-and-so? Sister so-and-so is over there. I can tell because we're in fellowship, and I can tell the exact spot to find her. And when you get there, you are going to find exactly that. If it is not like that, there is no fellowship. And we're coming to real fellowship in our church in Jesus' name. I is for interest. Interest. There are some people that are so independent and indifferent. They couldn't care if you were dying. They're not interested in any other thing except my, my family, my children, my house, my people, my nation, my country, my church, my offering, my everything, just mine. They are not interested in any other person. But if there is fellowship, the eye there is interest. You're interested in me. You're, am I happy? You're interested. Am I sad? You're interested. Am I getting on well? You are interested. Are you getting on well? I'm interested. What's your career about? I'm interested. And what about your family? I'm interested. But you know, somebody who is indifferent and independent and he says, you know, if, if you heard that you died, it will just, oh, what a pity. The man has died. And then he goes on with his life. There's no fellowship there, but there will be interest in fellowship. Give me a good amen. amen. And then, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. The peace there is peace. You see, when there's fellowship, there will be peace among us. And uh, the pastor will not be spending the whole time, lifetime of ministry, setting quarrels. You know, since that's so-and-so is, uh, you know, falling out with us, that's so-and-so again. Pastor, so-and-so is uh, not in good times, so-and-so. There'll be peace among us when there is fellowship. And that's why it says, and they continued in the apostles' doctrine and what? And fellowship. It shows their spirituality. And I pray that our church will be spiritual in Jesus' name. I come to point number three now. That's the stage and the standing of the end time church. The stage and the standing of the end time church. We're coming back to this Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. We're looking over that verse again in Acts chapter 2, verse 42. Acts chapter 2. Verse 42, it says in verse 42, and they continued, and they continued in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. They continued steadfast in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, but about the end time church, what happens to the church at the end of the age? The church at the time in which we're living. First Timothy chapter, chapter 4. First Timothy chapter 4, I read here from verse 1. First Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. The church of the end time. The end time church. In First Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. At the end of the age, things are going to change. That the church at large, Christendom, will not continue in the apostles' doctrine. That's why you don't need to examine the local church you belong to. You know, some people say, it doesn't matter what church I go to, of course it matters. It doesn't matter who is preaching to me, of course it matters. It doesn't matter what doctrine I believe, of course it matters. If you are aiming for the rapture and you want to make it on the final day, you cannot just say, it doesn't matter which church I go, I can go to any church because all roads lead to Rome. That's Rome. All roads do not lead to heaven. It's the narrow way that leads to heaven. That's why Jesus said, you seek out and find out which is the narrow way that leads to heaven because only few find that. Broad is the way, and broad is the gate that leads to perdition, that leads to hellfire. And you don't want to be caught on the final day in that broad way. And it says over here that in the last time, in the latter day, 
end of time. It says they'll give it to doctrines of, of who? Of devils. Can I believe the doctrines of, hev- of devils and get to heaven? Of course, no. That's why it matters what you believe. Look at verse 6 of that same chapter. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine. Uh huh. That's bad doctrine, that's good doctrine. But you want to nourish your people in good doctrine. It says, whereunto thou hast attained. Look at verse 15 of that same chapter. Verse 15. Meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly, entirely, completely to them, that thy profiting may appear unto all. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. You see that? Take heed unto thyself. And to the doctrine. And he's talking to Pastor Timothy here. You know, we pastors look up here. We pastors have a peculiar problem. Me included. We like a large church. We like, we like a full church, a full house. You know, I come to church in the morning, and then I see some, I see that half of the chairs are not occupied. And I say, What's the matter? Did I say something last week that drove the people away? Or is it my attitude? Am I people friendly, visitor friendly, invitation friendly, children friendly? Am I community friendly? You know, we're asking ourselves all the time. And if you don't take heed to yourself, what will happen is you find that, uh, you know, you have a small member in the church. You begin to ask people, why didn't they come? Where have they gone? Have they stopped coming to church? Well, they stop coming here, but they go to that other place. You say, why? Because, Pastor, this, uh, you know, righteousness and restitution and holiness without which no man shall see is too hard for the people. You don't know the economy is down. You don't understand that people now, they are not interested in heaven, heaven, heaven. They're interested in what will I do to keep soul and body together? What are we going to eat? How is this going to happen? Look at those people there, 38, 39. They have not married, and they want to get married. Oh, you're preaching is holiness, holiness. Look at those uh, children there. They are going to pay school fees. Holiness, holiness. Look at the other one there. He doesn't have papers. He wants to get papers to us to stay here, even for eternity. And he, and he doesn't have the papers. And you, can, you don't come and talk about how, you know, we make this assignment for you and make this assignment for you and we're thinking of you this way, thinking of you that way. Or you're coming to say, this, this pastor, that's why they are going. That kind of information shakes us pastors. And that's why it says, take it to yourself and to the doctrine. Because otherwise we'll be carried away and we'll say, we we'll want them to come, we want them to come. If we want them to come like that, we'll become like all the other churches. That's what happened to the other churches that now there is no standard, there is no doctrine. It's the people that determine and dictate what the pastors are going to preach because they want to be people friendly. But here, by the grace of God, when you yes, of course, we love people. Part of fellowship, I told you, fellowship is F is for forgiveness, E for education. Edification. L there is what? Of course, there must be love. But it is not love without teaching. Love without firmness. Love without knowing that we're going to heaven. That heaven is still the number one goal. And we're going to get there in Jesus' name. Look at that verse 16 again. It says, take heed unto thyself. I say, pastor, and to the doctrine. Then it says, continue in them. For in doing this... Thou shalt both save thyself and them that follow thee. He's saying that your own salvation is at stake. If you don't continue, if you know you water down everything so as to bring people in, your salvation is at stake. It's better not to be a pastor than to be a pastor and compromise and then you jeopardize your own eternal life and then the salvation of the other people too. Let's look at Second Timothy. Second Timothy chapter 3. The church of the end time. Second Timothy chapter 3 verse 1. It says, This know also that in the latter times, in the latter times, latter days, perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. 
That's what people think about today. Lovers of their own selves. They don't care what happens to other people. They don't even think we need to, you know, take care of other people. Just them. Just them. Then verse 5. It says in verse 5, having a form of godliness. That means they still go to church. That means they're still religious. That means they still want to be counted as, you know, people of God. They have a form of godliness. But they deny the power thereof from such. What does it say? Tell me out loud. Turn away. You know, say, look up here for a moment. What if you came to see me at the end of the church service today? And then I say, okay, how are you? And then you say, well, I'm, I'm all right. I say, um, are you a member of uh, Deeper Life? Or you say, no, I just came to this church today. And I, okay, which church do you go? And uh, then you said, where well, I go to this church, that church. I say, oh, I don't know about that church. What do they teach there? Well, you say they are just good, good people, nice people. You know, you, I had you this morning, but, you know, we don't do that in our church. We don't talk about doctrine, Bible. And then you preach for almost one hour, more than one hour. In our church, they give us sermonage to make Christianity. And, um, you know, we don't spend all that time. We spend you know, 10 minutes and then our pastor is through. Our pastor is so, you know, is so genial, is so generous and is so loving. And just, you know, we shake hands and all that. And uh, so I said, come out of that place. What? I said, come out of that place. You say, and now I know that you are not of God. Because, you know, I'm in a church and they love me. And, and you say, come out. I didn't tell you, come out. The Bible says so. It says if they have a form of godliness. And they deny the power, the power thereof. That is no salvation there. If there's no righteousness there, if the grace of God does not come there to help us live a life that is getting ready for the rapture, it says from there, from such a place, turn away. It means get out and get to a place where you get to heaven. And that's what you'll tell your child. You know, child, your child is going to school, and in that school, they're not teaching them syllabus, and everybody there is failing their final exam. You take your child out of that place, if you get to, a hospi to an hospital, in that hospital, everybody is dying. Nobody is getting well there. You take your patient away from that hospital. If you go to a place where, you know, you are walking there and there's no, there's no salary, there's no work, you tell the people to come out of that place. Why is it that when it is church, then the truth is not being taught. There's no salvation. There's no holiness. And there's no preparation for heaven. And then we tell you, come out and say, how can I come out? Just like how you come out from a bad hospital where they're killing people. I don't want them to kill you. I said, I don't want them to kill you. Okay, don't go to a place where they'll kill you spiritually. That's why it says, from such, turn away. Praise the Lord. At least if nobody can tell you, I will tell you. I said, I will tell you. And then after I've told you, then I'm away, so you can't see me tomorrow and say, that's the pastor that told me. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I pray that you'll, take, you'll be wise because of eternity. Wise because of your own soul. Wise because you know, I, I'm looking for heaven, and this is the way to heaven, and I'm going to keep to that in Jesus' name. Uh, I'm looking at um, chapter 4 now of Second Timothy chapter 4. Second Timothy chapter 4. I'm reading here from verse 2. Second Timothy chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 2. Here it says in verse 2, preach the word. Thank God we'll do that. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering. And, and what? And doctrine. And then it says, for the time will come. When they will not endure, tell me, sound doctrine, the time will come. It's the end time. And this is that end time. It says the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts, it says, shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. Somebody that will tickle them. Somebody that will just motivate them and just make them feel good and feel happy. Though they're on their way to hell. It says, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things. Endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of thy 
ministry. Hebrews chapter 8, I'm reading verses chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13, I'm reading verses 8 and 9. Hebrews 13, verses 8 and 9. Hebrews 13, verse 8. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. Has Jesus changed? His teaching. Has his teaching changed? His expectation. Has that expectation changed? The standard of getting to heaven, has it changed? No. And then it says in verse 9, Be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines. Be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines. When you listen to some people, even sometimes on the radio, diverse and strange doctrines, don't be carried about. But understand that before you can be saved, there's necessity of repentance and believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. And then when you become saved, there is an evidence to that. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation, a new creature. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. And so it says, be not carried about with strange and diverse doctrines, diverse and strange doctrines, for it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace and not with meat, which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. So the Lord wants us to continue till the very end. Revelation chapter 2. In Revelation chapter 2, I read from verse 14 and verse 15. Revelation chapter 2, reading from verse 14 and verse 15. Revelation 2, verse 14. But I have a few things against thee. You don't want to hear that on the final day. It's okay to even to hear that now I have a few things against you. When it's possible to make correction, when you can still turn and say, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for that. When you can still have cleansing in the blood of the Lamb, and it tells you, I have a few things against you. What if you don't want anybody to tell you now that this is wrong? No doctor to tell you that you know your BP is too high. Nobody to tell you that that's the sign of diabetes. Take care of that. Nobody to tell you that uh -uh, that uh, you think uh, you know that pain you're having, there's a blood, there's a rupture inside. Nobody to tell you uh, because when they give me that kind of information, it makes me feel unhappy. It unsettles me. Emotion is not good. The doctor doesn't know what he's doing to me. Don't tell me that. Just tell me you'll be all right. You'll be all right. That thing means nothing. Then you die. The same thing spiritually. It's better to tell you now. That this is wrong, this is wrong, that is wrong. Rather than waiting until the final day, and especially those of us who are pastors and preachers, I don't want the Lord to wait until the final day and then tell me, hey, you're a preacher, I have a few things against thee at the gate of heaven. That's too late. And the same thing with you as a person a member of the church. I have a few things against you. If the Lord is going to tell us anything he has against us, this is the time when I can pray, when I can make correction, when I can go back to Calvary again and have all those things he has against me cleansed, washed, purged, and taken, taken away from my life. This is the best time to do that. Look at verse 14. But I have a few things against the because... Thou hast them there, them that hold the doctrine of Balaam. You see that? When you hold the false doctrine, Christ has something against you. And this is the time to drop that kind of erroneous doctrine, false doctrine. He says, I'm against you for that. And then he said, because he taught Balaam, he gave, uh, he laid or he taught uh, Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, and to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit what? Fornication. You know, there are some people that, oh, they say the grace of God is there. 
They say, you know, the people who emphasize this and that. They say, that's all flesh. That's just flesh. What does it matter? I mean, you know, flesh, flesh, and all that. But what's important is your spirit, the spiritual. What's important is, you know, just go along like this. But they teach the people of God to commit fornication. They say, it's all flesh. You know, that doesn't matter at all. What the Lord is looking at is your spirit and your soul. That's wrong. That's erroneous. It will get you to hellfire. That's why you want to tell yourself that this is the way to go, the way of righteousness, and you're going to remain in that righteousness until he comes in Jesus' name. And then a pastor will not allow anybody in the church that will be going around teaching other people against the doctrine of holiness that leads to heaven. If you allow that and say, well, I will keep myself. It doesn't matter what anybody is teaching any other person outside there. I'm not responsible. Jesus said you are responsible. You allow that person there to be teaching them the doctrine of Balaam and to commit fornication. Look at verse 15. It says, so as thou them also that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which sin I hate. You know, there are things that Jesus hates. And if you're a real child of God, you better hate the things he hates. Look at verse 25. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 25, it says in verse 25, but that which ye have already, tell me, hold fast till I come. Hold fast till I come. I read that often. I have something. I said I have something. When Deeper Life started in 1973, I wouldn't have started, you know, Deeper Life if I didn't have something. I had the grace of God. I'm holding that fast. And I have the doctrine of the Bible, the teaching of the word. Holding that fast. It says, if you're expecting the coming of the Lord, it says what you have already, don't you allow anything to take it away from you. I went to university. I didn't allow university to take it away from me. I, you know, mix with people. I didn't allow them to take it away from me. What you have, hold it fast until I come. I pray you'll do that in Jesus' name. He that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end. Unto the end. This is the end time period. End time church. It says you hold it, to the, keep it to the end. It says uh, if you do that, the, that person, you hold it to the end, to him will I give power over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. As the, as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken. Then it says to shivers, even as I received of my father. And I will give him the morning star. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Anybody having ears to hear there? Praise the Lord. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. Continue. That's what he's telling us. Continue. But you must start before you can continue. They continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. As the strength of the church, the strength of the early church, is the strength of the edified church, edifying church, is the strength of the evangelical church, the strength of an established church. Continue. Give yourself to the Lord. If you are not born again, It's a wonderful time to surrender your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. Very simple. It's just a matter of saying, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. Public sin, private sin, known sin. The Spirit of God convicts you. But I'm sorry. Forgive me. I believe Jesus died for me. On the cross of Calvary. Lord, I believe my sins are forgiven. Give me grace to now walk in righteousness, to walk in the light, no more in darkness. 
And I promise the Lord you'll continue. That's the evidence of your salvation. You'll continue. In the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. Remember, God is no respecter of persons. Doesn't have different standards for different people. Different standard for Africa, America, Europe, England. Holiness doesn't take on a different meaning from one geographical location to the other. Holiness is holiness. And without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. And he's the one that measures holiness. He knows what he wants. Fellowship, forgiveness, edification, love, light, Openness, obedience, winsomeness, and worship, sharing, sincerity, honesty, humility. Interest. There will be no selfishness when there's real fellowship. You don't think just about yourself. Self centeredness is not part of fellowship. Sharing. Interest in other people. Peace. You're peace loving. You're not the one always looking for a way to make trouble. Peace. They continued in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful worship. Thank you for bringing us to this point to make us to look at our lives and look at the future and look at your demand for our kingdom citizens. We pray, Lord, that all these things will write on the tables of our hearts in Jesus' name. And we pray, Lord, that each of us, having known you as Lord and Savior, will continue in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in Jesus' name. When the temptation comes to fall back, to go back, to look back, we pray the grace and the strength of character to resist temptation and remain firm in your truth. You grant to every one of us in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, whatever is uh, making us in our heart, in our habit, in our lifestyle to be against fellowship, Lord, we just pray if it's some forgiving spirit, if it's fault finding or whatever it may be, we just pray that you help us to come back to fellowship and have real biblical fellowship in Jesus' name. Help us to abide in your truth. And we know that when we abide in the truth, you shall know the truth and the truth will make us free. We'll, make, we'll pray, Lord, free us and uh, set us free from every harassment of the devil in Jesus' name every kind of bondage and every kind of uh, affliction, we pray that you destroy for my lives in Jesus' name. We pray the joy of the Lord and the joy of true worship, acceptable worship, will be our strength in Jesus' name. Make each Christian here strong. Make each family strong. Make the whole church strong. And make deeper life in the UK strong, standing on the word in Jesus' name. Help us, Lord, in these last days not to backslide 
and not to go the way of the world and the way of other churches that believe doctrines of demons and doctrines of men and traditions of men. Help us, Lord, to be stable on the word of God in Jesus' name. Make us free. Keep us free until we see you face to face. Whatever will hinder us from making it on that final day of rapture, Lord, take it from our lives in Jesus' name. Confirm your mighty power in our lives. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name, we pray.